Welcome to the Judgment Call Podcast, a podcast where I bring together some of the most curious minds on the planet, risk takers, travelers, adventurers, investors, entrepreneurs, or simply mind borrowers. To find all the episodes of this show, please go to iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, or go to judgmentcallpodcast.com. For more resources, including how to become a guest, how to advertise, and to see all the lectures, podcasts, and books I would like to would like you to listen to or read, please also go to our website at judgmentcallpodcast.com. Like this show, please consider leaving a review on iTunes or like us and subscribe to us on YouTube. That will make it easier for other users like you to find us later on. This episode of the Judgment Call Podcast is sponsored by Mighty Travels Premium. Full disclosure, this is also my business. What we do at Mighty Travels Premium is to find the best travel deals for you as they happen. We do that in economy, premium economy, business and first class, and we screen 450,000 new airfare deals every day just for you and present the best based on your preferences. Thousands of subscribers have saved up to 95% on the airfare deals. In case you didn't know, Americans and Europeans can already travel to more than 80 different countries again, South America, in Africa, and in Eastern Europe. To try out Mighty Travels Premium for free, go to mightytravels.com slash MTP. If that's too much for you to type, just type in mtp4u.com, mtp for you.com to start your 30 day free trial. I'm very excited today to be here with Jay Zhao. And Jay is an entrepreneur turned VC and is currently a, a partner of T Fund, which is um, also called TCL Ventures. And uh, TCL uh, is a big Chinese mainland corporation, and uh, T Fund is uh, a subsidiary of the company and makes venture investments worldwide. And uh, before that, Jay was a partner at Walden Ventures and uh, a principal at Granite Ventures. Both are in the Silicon Valley. Welcome to the Judgment Call podcast. Jay, it's good to have you. Thank you for having me. Hey, it's absolutely, good to be here. absolutely. We're very curious. Maybe you can uh, first shed a little bit more light on the current fund you're working with, um, that you're running, T Fund, um, and maybe give us an idea about TCL. And also, we want to know about what what brought you to the dark side, so to speak, what brought you to venture capital, leaving entrepreneurship. Um, maybe you can give us some idea of your background. Yeah, happy to do that. Um, so just to give you a new update. Um, so I'm I'm now an advisor to T Fund um, after starting T Fund about two and a half years ago. Um, I'm actually uh, uh, running my own fund. Um, it's a side fund. Um, it's just getting started, right? Just like a okay. uh, startup. So it's well, called, congratulations. Thank you. Uh, it's exciting. Uh, a really humbling journey uh, as well. Um, but it's really um, about focusing on backing automation economy companies. Uh, the, the fund is called Leonis Capital. And uh, the idea is that we will be the first check writer to back um, AI first companies. Um, in both U.S. and China. So uh, we don't really care where the company comes from, um, but we love to back um, global-minded founders uh, that fits along with the thesis. Um, and to give you, um, you know, like you said, right, I had the fortune to uh, start a um, venture fund like T-Fund um, that was backed by TCL, which is, uh, you know, uh, uh, one of the largest consumer electronic company in the world. And the idea was really to um, invest in entrepreneurs in uh, China, in the U.S., and also in Israel. So quite ambitious goal. And we set it up the entity very similar to Google Ventures, where we combine the best of venture investing, uh, as well as corporate resource and insight uh, to helping those companies. Um, and we did a good amount of investment in 2018 and 2019. And maybe we'll talk more about it uh, later on. But, you know, as you know, as the tech decoupling between U.S. and China, you know, get more, um, uh, more advanced, right, over the past two years, um, the investment uh, just kind of getting harder to do. Um, 
having said that, you know, most investment that we did uh, in all those three regions have performed really well. Um, before that, I was uh, leading early stage investment in two venture funds. Uh, one is called Warden and the other one is uh, Grand Adventures. Both are really well established fund. Um, I learned quite a lot. Um, one was uh, started in 1974. Uh, along with Sequoia and Klein and Perkin. So if you, want, if you want to learn like the classic and, and the best way to practice venture, um, then you, know, you, you can't find a better place to, um, to learn the craft from. So um, I build my experience and my track record at those two funds. Uh, some of the investments that uh, we did um, at those venture funds our companies, um, I'm thinking about more consumer driven companies. So we're investor, um, shareholder in Airbnb and also uh, investor in Pandora um, and shareholder, uh, early shareholder in Netflix um, as well. And then on top of that, obviously, we also invest in a lot of enterprise companies, successful en enterprise companies um, like Anaplan, Marketa, um, to name a few. Uh, both of them are you know, in the range of $5 billion to $10 billion uh, market cap company now. Uh, but, you know, most people recognize consumer brand uh, much easier than the enterprise companies. But for us, for Leonis Capital, we focus on both. Um, we might talk a little bit more about AI-driven companies um, in enterprise space and also in consumer space. Yeah, that's, um, a, really good, that's a really good theme. Um, yeah. And I know you, you recognize how much of a buzzword, buzzword it is right now. And, yeah. Um, but there is there is a big theme in the market out there, and I, I, I you know I'm a personal user and developer with AI, so I know what it can do. Uh, we had Stephen Schwartz on a couple of episodes ago, who's a statistics professor and was one of the first uh, founders, I'd say, of an AI startup back in the in the 80s, and he he mm. gave us a, a very interesting view how this is partially just a hype, partially it is statistics, and partially there's something great going on, which I learned from David Orban last week is really the way of acceleration with AI is way faster than Moore's law. So I feel we all have heard at least some buzzwords and some of us uh, in the audience have played around the different AI mechanisms. Um, give us an idea what, what the last fund, and I know that was already focused on AI, well, give us an idea what kind of are you looking for, what's like the perfect startup that you would like to invest to right now. And, if AI is still um, as much of a focus in your new fund, and if so, um, what what does it mean using AI in the enterprise? Because when we think of AI, we think first of Google algorithms or Facebook algorithms or self-driving cars, right? Mm -hmm. Yep, that's a good question. So AI is a really broad term, right? People kind of throw different meanings and different uh, their own understanding into the uh, into the term of AI. And uh, you know, a couple of years ago, there was a debate about you know whether AI is going to end humanity or not. Um, and I think that was uh, that was the emotion kind of mixed with uh, the typical movies that that we have seen in the past. But I think in reality, uh, in terms of venture investment opportunity, uh, we're mostly talking about vertical AI, so uh, the AI driven or AI enabled applications for either consumer case or enterprise case. Um, I don't think it's a hype. I don't think um, it's a fad uh, for sure, because uh, what we have done is that we have looked at you know tech evolution over the past uh, let's say 40, 50 years. Every 10 years, you have a mega trend that's taking place. So if you think about it, you know in the 1980s, uh, that's that was uh, IT and infrastructure, and then to the wave of wave of, of, of internet. And then uh, we have cloud and then mobile. Um, and now what we believe at 2020 and going forward, next 10, 20 years, is going to be AI-driven uh, automation economy. So, so those are the bigger mega trend uh, that we, we try to wrap our heads around. Not only to identify the next iconic uh, companies, not just unicorn companies, the iconic company that will last 50, 100 years or even longer. Um, and those companies' creation are really um, strongly tied to the mega tech trend. Uh, and not only, th not only that, right? If you think about um, the creation of venture capital fund, it's the same thing. You cannot create the time. We talk about like timing for entrepreneurs, for companies. You have to ride the, the, the perfect wave or you, you have to be at the right place at the right time. Same idea with venture capital fund. Um, 
Sequoia was started when the whole wave of IT infrastructure and PC uh, was just around the corner, right? And uh, they were backing, in the early stage of venture capital, were backing a lot of, of uh, semiconductor companies, the infrastructure type, type of companies. Um, but, you know, for the one that did well, um, that kind of accumulate, you, you kind of gain your reputation and gain your uh, first step of success by making those uh, investments based on the trend. And then later on, you know, you have a new, new, a newer and younger um, uh, venture fund that's better identify uh, uh, tech trend like internet, like mobile, and like cloud. Um, so similarly, uh, with AI first companies and automation economy companies, it actually calls for a different type of uh, investors, um, maybe more nimble, um, maybe uh, have a different pattern recognition uh, for those companies to, to thrive. So to answer your question, um, you ask like, what are the type of companies that we're excited about? Um, you know, we can kind of go in very depth about it because we wrote a whole thesis about, you know, this investment opportunity and why we started uh, Leonis Capital. But to sum it up, you know, we are excited about uh, AI first companies um, to solve really specific problems in real industries. So, for example, um, how do you use AI uh, to solve um, the, the inefficiency problem or increase inf inefficiency, uh, increase efficiency? Uh, in front of a manufacturer setting, or for healthcare setting, or for uh, payment and fintech. Um, so those are the day-to-day -day life, uh, what we call the real economy uh, in people's day-to-day -day life. Um, but with uh, AI first approach, you are not just talking about you know the digitization of a cloud software. You know, kind of just kind of uh, put your data from offline to online, but instead we're seeing the trend of big or small companies migrating and, and trying to strategize in what, how can we better util, utilize the data? Not for just business insight, but actually for real action, uh, uh, you know, for uh, either for software de delivery or for people's uh, user experience um, uh, from the consumer side. So I, I really like what you just said, and, and I think it uh, is very honest of you because it kind of, is rare for venture capitalists to admit that they're actually trend followers, right? They need to see and identify a trend, but also they need to figure out who is going to make this trend even bigger. This could be the public markets, it could be other follow-on investors. So that's something that a lot of um, venture capitalists don't really want to talk about. Mm -hmm. um, but but going back, going back, and I hope I, I, I'm I'm interpreting you correctly here. But going back to AI, um, a lot of people might not be familiar with the relatively broad scope that we just talked about. Once you look back into the investments you did in the last two or three years, what is like your favorite portfolio company that is in the AI space where you feel like, well, this really actually developed the way um, we predicted it? Uh, that, I mean, that's a really, <laughs> really tough call, right? So um, the beauty of early stage investing is that um, the delta could be the performance delta could be really high. Um, that's when you hear about you know the, the return of 10x and 100x and even more um, because you were able to take the risk early on and therefore you're a meaningful partner to, to the to the founders. Um, but at the same time that's a scary thing because a lot of things could change and you have to deal with a lot of unknowns. Um, one company that kind of came to mind, um, it's really uh, about backing the founder um, at the early stage. Um, it's a company called Sleeper, uh, S-L-E-E-P-E-R. So they are the number one leader in the fantasy sports space. So if you a uh, sports fan or you love uh, play uh, fantasy sports with your friends, um, they are really the number one app um, out there. So what they have built is not only a really slick app, but um, if you think about the type of founder that we like, the one with global perspective and global minded. Um, they started a company about four years ago, uh, three or four years ago. So with the idea that if you look in the US, uh, we have a lot more consumer app that's single purpose focus, right? You go to Yelp for you know a business like uh, rating review, and then you go to uh, Facebook uh, for the social content, and then you go to a messaging app or WhatsApp for text messaging. But then if you look at China, uh, WeChat is one of those very successful and widely adopted 
a super app out there. So when Slipper, they have their idea about building a super app for sports fans um, in a place that you can consume content, uh, you can uh, play games, you can message with other people, uh, and you can even, uh, you know, kind of gifting, uh, do the virtual gift uh, with your friends. It, it's it's not a new, it's not a um, kind of a, uh, uh, well, I would say it's kind of like novel concept, uh, you know, to the very least, to do a lot of uh, investor in the Valley. Um, but to me, uh, I think it makes sense, right? Because if you compare the consumer behavior in both countries, uh, some are different, but a lot, a lot are the same. Uh, that the key is that can you build, can you execute a well-crafted product uh, around that thesis? So um, for that company, um, I was uh, lucky enough to be able to bond with the team and, um, you know, wrote the first personal check and then onboard as an advisor. Right now, they, uh, they raise a B round from well-established firm like Andreessen and General Catalyst. So both are big funds manage like $2 billion uh, asset under management. Um, so it's quite a, quite a right, you know, from where they were to, to where they are now. Uh, but at the beginning, it was not that easy. Like after, you know, we invest in the company, um, then they had the difficulty in terms of how to, how to sustain the user growth and how to keep engaging users in the in a uh, in a scalable and efficient way, uh, and to the point that you know uh, I think there was it was a confusion period that we don't know where the product direction would be and would get involved going forward. Um, so that's really you know when you hear about early stage ventures um, and investors talk about early stage investments, um, it's really just about the team, uh, Nan, Weishi, and Ken. Uh, they're the type of founders. Uh, that demonstrate that they have a you know conviction about the idea uh, to the degree that at before they raise any capital uh, they're just really working for on the garage like you talk about Silicon Valley companies but they really work on the garage sleep on the couch and uh, just nothing will kind of dissuade them um, to not pursuing a sleeper so to me um, that was a good sign uh, that was, that's one of the best quality that you can look for in early stage founders um and if you ask me like if, if you go to sleeper.com like they do uh, a lot of different things now including um allowing people to play game uh, uh fantasy sports game around esports and that's something that i didn't anticipate right when we uh, invest in the company but um, yeah you I, I i like how you described this as a partnership it's something yeah. that you did together with the entrepreneurs you know, I've been raising money the last 20 years. I have like a dozen startups that I've been involved in, most of them on the operational side. And I always found that you get the typical VC pitches, like we're going to be your partner, we're going to open up the doors, we're going to give you follow-up funding. And uh, once the trend um, changes, and it always changes, as you just described, every company goes all through these pivots usually. And what usually happens is that they... They give you a year, and then if your numbers don't look um, very explosive, they typically um, either replace you, um, they cut off your funding, they don't give you follow-up funding. Um, so this is this is often a problem that you get a very different pitch um, from the uh, initial investors. And often what, what they do in the end is uh, transform into someone who is both, you know, very, not as personal, um, often very arrogant. Uh, it seems to be an occupational hazard in the VC industry. Uh, not very open to your ideas anymore. And uh, um, obviously, if your startup rises very well, then these attitudes change. What I'm trying to say is there isn't really a partnership. There is, and maybe this is a good thing. It's really based on what happens within 12 to 18 months with a startup. If it really explodes, you're going to be invited to all the parties. If it's one of the 95% that doesn't really explode, and maybe it's growing, but it's not really within that vector that LVC was, was looking for, maybe the best you can hope for is a referral to a company that buys you. So I always feel like the, the VC um, reputation and the, the actual, um, especially if you go further in the, in the later funding rounds, is slightly different um, in reality. And I know you, you are you're trying to establish a different um, personality of a VC. Um, do you think you can keep that up? Or is it something that everyone starts out humble and curious and wants to make a decent amount of money? The first billion is in, they become arrogant and far off and uh, very difficult to talk to. Yeah, so this is, this is a very good question. And, uh, and obviously, I've been thinking about, um, about it a lot. 
Um, so um, one of the things, uh, well, perspective that I have is um, uh, I was uh, I was an entrepreneur myself before turning to VC. So I know how difficult it was to raise capital and how difficult it was to face a lot of rejections. And even if you get the funding, you still have to go through the roller coaster ride uh, with the up and down. Um, so with that type of uh, experience, um, it's, tr it's truly either you have the experience or you don't, right? And that's what enable you to build that empathy and the connection with the founder at the early stage. So I will kind of break down your question in two parts. One is um, uh, at a high level, right? And I, I do think um, there is a disconnection between um, what VC uh, just in general like, has put in front of themselves like, you know, uh, as a face, right? Many VCs call themselves founder friendly and, um, you know, kind of uh, will align with you, you know, kind of do everything that they can to get the allocation that they need, that they need okay, into the deal. And then afterwards, you know, things kind of evolve, things change. Um, I think that has been the practice over the past five, five, uh, five to eight years, roughly, when capital is more abundant than the high quality of deals. But um, I do think it's important to recognize the interest between founder and venture fund are not completely aligned. Um, that, that just talk about that, right? Because uh, what, for example, what could be a life-changing exit or event uh, of exit, let's say $10 million or $20 million, that could be life-changing to an entrepreneur, you know, start his, his or her first company. But then that, that might not be meaningful to a billion dollar venture fund because you're not driving the type of return they're looking for, so they really don't care, right? They would rather have the optionality for you to go big or go home than to have that small realization of access. Um, and I think oftentimes, you know, either founders, they don't want to recognize that because they would rather to, uh, they would rather uh, kind of prioritize the, um, the brand name of the firm, the, 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 the high number of the fund size over what's really aligned, you know, under the hood. Um, I'm not saying you should go either way. You should go with a big fund uh, and then you, you should go with a small fund. It just each, uh, each fund, uh, their fund size kind of dictate their interest uh, alignment with you and, and the type of goal that you're trying to achieve. That's for sure, yeah. Jay. Um, yeah. I, I, I'm totally with you there. Um, yeah. And I think entrepreneurs have learned that lesson. Um, yeah. That's obviously a disconnect. But I mean, people who don't realize this as an entrepreneur, they're idiots, if you, if you ask me. They don't know what mm -hmm. they're doing, right? I mean, there needs to be a certain professionalism, even to entrepreneurs, even if you talk about 18-year-olds. So I mean, that that is obviously true. If you if you take money at a hundred million dollar valuation, then um, one hundred fifty million dollars is not a great exit. Um, mm -hmm. Fifty million is losing money. So I think entrepreneurs understand that that if they kind of make the deal with the devil and go with the, with the big fund, raise on a high valuation, maybe actually too high, um, they do have to shoot for an extremely high exit relatively quickly. Well, that's dependable with, at least um, within the fund running time. So I think entrepreneurs know that, but I still feel the, the, the general pitch of a partnership um, is kind of rare. I mean, I'm not saying it doesn't exist, but I'd say it's 90% marketing and 10% real from my point of view. But maybe I'm wrong. Maybe it's the opposite. Maybe entrepreneurs lie, and they do lie all the time. I, I'm fully with you. I mean, the entrepreneurs lie all the time, and the VCs lie all the time. So I'm just focusing on VCs now. <laughs> yeah, no, no, I hear you. I, I think the, the point that you're trying to make is that, you know, how much is a real service and real value add? versus just, you know, marketing and, and a lip service, right, that's being delivered yeah. to, to the thin entrepreneurs. And I think that's a good point. Um, you know, from my own personal experience, uh, I have spent time uh, at two different venture funds that was well-established and co-founding one venture platform at T-Fund and now fully starting my own. Um, and, and for a period of time, I actually was really obsessed with the whole formation and foundation of venture capital fund or venture capital firm, because if you think about it, not many venture capital fund, uh, firm can sustain as long as, um, you know, Warden, as long as Sequoia, as long as Kleiner Perkin. Um, and obviously Sequoia is the, is, is the one that's kind of not only sustained long, but also they've been the number one for so many, so many years. So what's the secret between that and many other venture funds that was starting from one and then quickly become irrelevant in year five or year 10, 
right? So that was an interesting question to me. So um, one of the questions and one of the reasons being, uh, well, there's multiple reasons, but one of the reasons uh, at high level is that uh, for a venture fund that's not able to sustain because if you think about venture, venture fund like a product, like a startup, you're not delivering value to the end customers. You, you might be able to get away with it you know, for the fund one, which usually lasts five to 10 years. But if you're not delivering value to them, um, then just like companies, you're not serving a market and then you become quickly uh, irrelevant. So the way that you think about this is that, you know, what's needed for a company's uh, 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 entrepreneur's journey, right? So you have different phase, you know, from pre-seed to seed to series A, series B and going beyond. So for us, um, and for, for the stage I'm passionate about, it's really the early stage. So you're talking about seed and uh, series A. So for these stage of companies, um, we, the bonding is super important. We, I, we're not interested in doing the brain surgery of replace, uh, replacing founders, because if you are thinking about that, just even one thought at that early stage, then you might not as well just not partner uh, with that company, right? So that's not, uh, that's not what you should, should be uh, focusing on. Um, but what you really want to do and the value add for that stage is that one, can you see eye to eye with that founder uh, at a personal, not just at business, business level, obviously you're doing business together, but at the personal level, like is your value aligned? The way I think about this is that, you know, and I often tell this to entrepreneurs that when you raise capital at early stage, you're not just taking check, but instead you're actually looking for a co-founder, right? Uh, except that it just happened to be this co-founder is going to bring, you know, a good amount of capital uh, with him or her. Um, so you really want to make sure that value uh, and the vision is is really much aligned. Now, going forward, if you raise your B and beyond, then you might not need the advice and service from that early stage co-founder, which is totally fine, you know, as you, as you scale up. So that's one thing um, you really want to do. And the second thing is that how can the early stage investor be value adding to you to find in helping you find the, the, the first batch of customers and how, how can he or her um, really, uh, uh, really, really make the business going, uh, kind of get off the ground uh, really quickly. So that often means a lot more, uh, you know, customer introductions. So for us, we actually have the CXO and advisory board um, that's purpose, purposefully construct to help um, a company that we invest uh, in terms of accelerating their go to market uh, and then setting up POCs. Um, so you will see many venture funds talk about it, but few of them will actually set up a program and the structure to, uh, to be embedded in the venture platform that you do uh, to support entrepreneurs. But frankly, it's too early to tell, you know, we'll see, you know, like right now it's, uh, we're, we're a startup ourselves. We kind of uh, um, put out our product roadmap out there. Uh, there's a lot more, a lot more work for us to do. You know, we're gonna deliver the results. So ask me that question five years later, and uh, and hopefully I can give you a better answer. I mean, I admire your approach. I think it's it's a really good one. I also like Daniel Gross's approach. You know, his accelerator, mm -hmm. making everything remote, and um, basically, he, he I think he's taking it maybe a little far. He's he's basically making entrepreneurship a basic algorithm. So you basically don't interact on a personal level. Mm -hmm. um, but you're just looking at numbers, and it's fully remote, right? You never have to talk to anyone. You 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 basically assume you can you're being defrauded anyways, but you you you're making it up in numbers. So I, I like this approach in terms of basic innovation. Uh, I think it's it's very hard to pull off on at scale, um, but I, it, it's it's definitely very and he's funded by Mark Andreessen and by Stripe. So they 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 see this as a great way to 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 try it out and, and nurture a different ecosystem. But I heard you talk about that before, that as a, as a VC, you need to be part historian, part biologist. And I would say you will also have to be a philosopher. Um, like you have to identify these big trends and then um, put them into abstract rules that you can follow, so-called first principles. So you don't have to start from scratch all the time. And I also feel you just said that it, there's a lot of psychology involved. You know, it's a bit like a, like a dating app. Uh, you you got to find out, are you on a, on a platonic level? And that's obviously different. But are you able to deal with that person for the next five years and have board meetings, have Zoom calls all the time? Or will you be annoyed after six months and then, you know, it's really not worth it. It's not worth your time. Um, I'm always I'm, I'm struggling with this because in my personal experience, often the most annoying people that I knew, because they were so annoying and socially awkward and like really abrasive, 
they delivered a lot of good returns because basically no one else would talk to them because everyone tried to avoid them. But like this was their social motivation to really excel at their job. So sometimes I feel clicking with someone is not necessarily the person that will be the most successful. Um, but you know, I have trouble making that judgment obviously um, a lot of times myself. Yeah. So uh, yeah, I, I think that's absolutely right. So the the part that we're trying to so this kind of tied to your uh, to your previous question is how do we um, evaluate early stage company when there are so many uncertainties and what are we looking for in terms of early stage companies? Um, the part that the team is obviously important. So um, I agree. I mean, a lot of tech founders um, they they're really good at the technology and the product they build, but not all of them has the kind of uh, the, you know, what would you call the salesman uh, type of personality uh, that's super sociable and very easy to, you know, get along with. And, uh, you know, if you think about like the, uh, you know, the, the, you know, book Steve Jobs, right? At the earliest of his career, uh, he didn't have a good, you know, easy time fundraising because his personality was just very hard to get along with. So I think for us, like the lesson for me, certainly the takeaway lesson is that you really have to lower your ego. So it's not about you get along with that person um, uh, at, at the level that satisfy your ego. Um, and frankly, you know, uh, from the position of writing checks, a lot of people will, will want to say what you would like to hear um, instead, of, instead of the truth, right? So, so that's a part that you really need to um, pay attention to. Um, so there's a phrase that you know, I, I think is really appropriate in investing world, uh, which is you know, just observe the presence. So observe the presence, meaning you have to listen and you have to listen hard. Um, that's why you have two ears and one mouth, right? So you, you want to listen to what the other person has to say and, uh, and to, to value whether there is some truth in it or not. But the other part, um, I would say, um, early stage is about founders, but founder doesn't uh, make up the whole equation. So the other part is the is the market, the market sizing, um, and that comes from an independent, uh, rather independent point of view. Uh, how do you think the market will evolve, and how big the market size is? And that's kind of when we think about venture investing, and the one the reason I named the fund Leolens Capital. You know, it, Leonis kind of represent the, you know, the star constellation, right? And uh, it's bright and it's long lasting, but more importantly, it, it's, a, it's a component of nature. So that's how we think about different things that are going on in business world, especially in startup and incumbent, their competition. Um, a lot of it kind of represent to, uh, you know, what we have learned from ecology, biology, very similar uh, in terms of how the, in the animal world, people compete. Well, in animal world, animals compete. Animals um, can thrive. The new when the new species, you know, come along, they pre present a different dynamic uh, to the ecosystem. So the same thing, you know, when we think about marketplace. Sorry, when we think about the big market or emerging market, we really want to understand how the dynamic uh, play into fact, and if that founder's point of view makes sense on that. So that's how. Um, that's, you know, it's really case by case, but that's kind of like general framework that we use when we evaluate early stage companies. Yeah, no, that's that's very good. And that kind of is a nice um, way to, to lead into another set of questions I have for you. Mm -hmm. You know, there is Peter Thiel's um, thesis that you're probably very familiar with about the, uh, the big stagnation that we have since the 70s, basically what he talks about, and that seems to accelerate in the wrong way. We have mm -hmm. a low productivity growth. Um, which uh, leads to low GDP growth. And um, it's not really clear where that came from, um, but why it was so much higher in the period after the Second World War. There's a couple of hypotheses, like people coming back from the war being exposed to technology, then there wasn't really an infrastructure to, to settle, be settled into. Um, and so they started companies, and these companies had huge productivity jumps. Um, the, and there's, there was a lot of basic research done, obviously, during the Second World War in order to make weapons. Um, so there's a lot of lot of ideas that float around, and uh, nobody really seems to have a good answer um, why this happened. And there is, I talked to um, a couple of prior guests, and we what what we what we some of them are really excited about is that AI alone might add 
10, 15 trillion, almost doubling the GDP um, of the US in the next t uh, 10 years, because what, what AI has the potential to do is basically free us of anything that's slightly repetitive, like extremely good decisions and anything that comes along businesses, outside businesses, anything we do, we, we basically have an AI that makes good decisions for us. So our first question is, what, do you, what, do you, what is your gut feeling about the big stagnation? Is it just like um, something people yammer about, but it's actually nothing to worry about? And second, do you think AI is going to be that key component to get us to the singularity, what Ray Kurzweil describes, and this is going to be the most driving factor? Yeah, so, um, I, um, so I kind of agree with what you said. Um, so I don't think we should worry too much about it. Um, that's, um, a, you know, if we look at the worldview, it really depends on how much you zoom in and how much you zoom out, right? So if you zoom out by, let's say, 10, 20 years or like 40, 50 years, then yes, there seems to be, um, you know, kind of this plateau of productivity after World War II, and we kind of hit this, um, this phase um, of the growth. But if you zoom out like, even further in the time scope of 100 and even 1,000 years, that you can see each time human beings, like uh, our productivity, productivity growth is highly associated with two things. One is the information breakthrough, and two um, is the energy breakthrough. So uh, one of the more recent example, obviously, is industrial revolution, right? So when we have the machine can replace a lot of manual work uh, in the manufacturing setting, then you see a huge uh, unleash of value creation um, in most of the developed world. Um, and then kind of going forward to where we are now, uh, I mean, I think people kind of, uh, uh, kind of underestimate how much the internet, uh, the, the, the value of the internet really created for our society. So people joke that, you know, we, uh, what's the word? I, we're hoping for flying car, but instead we've got one, 140 characters, right? But True. I mean, I think both things, um, uh, it's, it's not apple to apple comparison, but at the same time, you know, if you have any tool, any type of social network can uh, facilitate the efficiency of information exchange, um, that's productivity. I mean, that helps human society as a whole to, uh, to be more productive um, at, 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 the, uh, at the holistic level. So let's not discount that. So just on the information piece, uh, I think going forward, we'll have a lot more information, uh, a lot more innovation um, in the next 10, 20 years. But to your question about, <laughs> about AI, um, as we uh, discussed previously before, I think a lot of uh, exciting things come from the vertical AI. So initially, uh, when I say initially, we're talking about like, you know, 10 years, 20 years type of uh, time frame. Initially, a lot more companies will be vertical focused AI companies. So you are less likely, less likely to see kind of Google uh, of AI or AI first type of Google um, that solve every problem uh, that's just being super horizontal. Uh, but instead, you're going to see who is the AI leader in the fintech space? Who is the AI leader in the healthcare space? And who is the AI leader in the digital media space? And in terms of digital media, we kind of already have one that we can look at and we can start to evaluate some early data, right? And that company is ByteDance. So ByteDance, they're really good at uh, distributing content and distributing information. So what that does is that instead of, uh, and then that's just hugely disruptive to a lot of industries, not just, um, not just you know, a music app, but to Google, the search engine, to Google, and also to Alibaba, to e-commerce. The reason being uh, the old way, you know, when I say old, it's actually not that old, right? Five years ago, uh, 10 years ago, you know, people are searching information by thinking about what I want. And then you kind of go to a website or go to phone and then type something in Google and, and search something. So that's human look for information. So what TikTok or ByteDance has done is reverse that equation and become information look for human, right? So we kind of, the algorithm kind of know what type of information that you want or you, or you need um, and, and, the, and, and kind of predict like at what time you're logging to the app, usually at 11 p.m. or usually at 10 a.m. Then it knows that what type of information you want, you want to see. 
So we kind of push the information to you. It kind of reverse that uh, that equation uh, from human look for information to information look for human. And simple as that, it's just super powerful. So, um, and the other point I will make quickly is that one thing that we have never seen about AI companies is that because um, uh, unlike the the, the 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 software company, unlike the cloud companies, because the data advantage uh, it's super critical to these AI first companies, uh, the ability to acquire those data uh, in a proprietary way and a cost effective way is going to be the key to make a break uh, the next iconic AI companies or AI first companies. Um, and at the same time, because of that component, you're able to uh, accumulate value in a much faster uh, speed and scale. And that's what I meant, you know, in the blog post that I uh, that I wrote uh, a few months ago um, about, you know, uh, w what does it mean uh, when we talk about AI first companies? So what that means is that, you know, if you look at ByteDance, if you look at, you know, UiPath and, uh, you know, companies like SenseTime, all these companies get to the scale of 10 billion to 100 billion in the relatively short amount of time for the very reason that like network effect, like uh, the typical kind of marketplace network effect that we have observed in Facebook, in Uber, and in you know, many other companies that we have seen in the last uh, tech trend. These AI companies have the data advantage and just like Snowball, it's gonna get uh, growing bigger, uh, but only gonna be more aggressive uh, in terms of growing the value in a, in, in a much faster speed. So that's something that we're pretty excited about. Um, and that's why, you know, when we think about like funding the next companies, uh, the, 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 the successful investments, it's not just about unicorn. You know, we want to back the next iconic company that will get to the trillion dollar valuation um, one day um, in, over the next yeah, 10, that's a, that's 10, a pretty years. tall order. Um, yeah. And I, I'm, I'm surprised you use it, that uh, TikTok example, because it uses um, an advanced, way advanced, but in the essence, a collaborative filtering that has been around since the 2000s with the Amazon and that Netflix has been um, having you know, ch their challenge. Um, mm -hmm. And there's, a, there's, a, there's parts of unsupervised learning in it and part of supervised. So there is, on a, in, a, in a core algorithmic basis, this is, has been around for at least a decade. And I, I fully agree with you, it hasn't been applied in that sense. Instagram and Twitter, they kind of played with it, but they never really got into it. They, they were stuck to this follower concept and TikTok just basically changed it. But I think what, what everyone is surprised about in the entrepreneurial community is not necessarily the algorithm, but the scale they pull it off. It's clearly the, the, the way of viral content and the initial seats they could afford. I mean, you have to buy those seats, but then the viral, um, take up of that has been um, pretty astonishing. And it's so impossible to, to predict this from my point of view, you probably have better data. If something will take off virally at some point, and if so, and when, how big will it get? That, that's really, really complicated um, to predict. I, I have no, no predictive model for this. And maybe we, we find an AI that has a predictive model for this one day. Maybe it's just the nodes um, in the network that you have to address. Um, I want to move a little bit further into into because ByteDance is, is a very unique entity, and maybe you know more of the backstory uh, driven by um, some relationship uh, to uh, to Chinese um, state-run companies. And I know ByteDance itself is probably not state-run. What is the impact of um, the state-run approval in China typically for for startups? And if you would go, say, you would go to Shanghai or Beijing. What kind of company would you start, and what are the reasons why it would work better in China than it does in the U.S.? Right. Um, so um, let me try to unpack that a little bit. So, sure. in terms of the content, um, you know, I think um, different countries have different reg regulation in terms of what contents are allowed within its own uh, its own um, its own law in its own territory. So, uh, so that part, you know, it's yeah, Donald Trump is not allowed anymore in the U.S. Right. So, so, so this changed so, quickly. Yeah, yeah. So, so exactly. So, so as investor, frankly, um, we are mindful of the regulation, and we think uh, companies you operate in that certain market, then you are obliged to comply with the law. So, you can disagree with the law, and that's a different issue. But from the capitalist standpoint of view, uh, that's how you. Uh, you know, that's how the game is set up. That's how you, uh, how you run your business. So, um, so there's no question about that, about that, uh, about that piece. 
So um, the second piece is about the the startup opportunity and the uh, the, the exciting opportunity in China uh, that might not be the same uh, dynamic in the U.S. So I would say two things. So one, uh, I think most people, especially especially my my peers uh, on the investment uh, uh, investment side in the U.S., uh, kind of uh, not fully appreciate or not fully understanding what's going on in China in terms of how fast the technology has been evolving and how aggressive the government has been pushing for the upgrade of uh, a lot of vertical industries that we have talked about. Um, so I will give you like some quick example. So at T-Fund, we were funding a lot of the um, uh, manufacturing, uh, what we call the smart manufacturing or manufacturing automation um, uh, uh, robotic companies. So these companies, they are U.S. companies, some are Israeli companies, some are Chinese companies. So we have the fortune to see uh, the same investment thesis um, in three major ecosystems and how they play out. And the one thing kind of surprised to me, um, uh, kind of uh, when you actually have the front row C to see what's unfolding, is that the customer adoption speed and the willingness to try new things uh, are actually much uh, bigger. The number of customers much bigger and the speed much faster in China than what we have uh, here in the U.S. So they just talk about like, so maybe it's just, you know, U.S. economy and Chinese economy is just at different phase. I mean, U.S. is more service driven and it's, uh, it's at different kind of level um, compared and different nature compared with, uh, uh, with, with Chinese economies. But at the same time, uh, you know, if we think about, you know, two sides of uh, government's uh, push for technology upgrade. You know, when, uh, I mean, before Trump, right, there was a whole talk about, um, you know, you uh, really leveraging technology to be position U.S. as the leader over the next, you know, 20, 30 years. Um, now, you know, with Trump, you know, things kind of changed uh, quite a bit, right, over the past four years. But with China, the thing, you know, put pol putting politics aside, with China, that has been quite consistent. I mean, over the past 10 years, uh, everybody knows like where the country's priority is and the government is pushing the private company, either private company or the state-run company to upgrade their, um, their software technology and hardware technology to be more efficient. I mean, there is more reason you know, behind that, right? You know, as China uh, economy is upgrading from export-driven to internal consumption-driven, it's just an inevitable step that you have to take. Um, but it's amazing to see, you know, how uh, over the past, like, five, ten years, um, you know, China definitely progressed quite a lot uh, on the industrial side. Um, so, so that's yeah, kind I of find this, I find this really fascinating. So I grew up in a communist country in eastern Germany, and um, I didn't think it was a lot of fun. It, it was kind of depressing. But I think what, what China has figured out, and that's, that's really... Um, that's really interesting to me, and that's where I'm very hopeful about that, is they, they have this virtuous circle of, of a state direction, which is almost bigger, in a, um, almost always bigger in a communist or somewhat communist country, um, even if that label obviously has many, many different meanings. The, the, the virtuous cycle of taking a lot of money from, um, save it, from Chinese savers, putting it back into um, technology, but also into basic infrastructure. So the, the, the amount of money that was sunk into infrastructure is way beyond the level of a developing country with the same income um, level. And that is a great thing, right? If you pour so much money into infrastructure, yes, a lot of money might be wasted, but in the end that pays off because the citizens become more productive. Once they're more productive, they make more money, they pay more taxes, and you make more money. So and I know you're a big fan of Ray Dalio, and I think people have overlooked this quite a bit, is how well this worked out for China because it has a, start, a stronger state um, complex. But once it goes into the right direction, you kind of end up more where Singapore is with their autocratic government. Mm -hmm. But that has pushed people in the right direction, at least for now. That might be over now, who knows. And the U.S. on the other side is at the end of their cycle with a lot of debt. And what, what surprised me the most is, you know, the COVID response that we've seen in the U.S. and in China. And the news came out today that China seemingly, we never know if these statistics are real, uh, barely had any GDP contraction. What that makes for me, and I, I've traveled a lot to China, I've seen how it changed over the years, and I went to second tier, third tier cities that are, you know, still 10 million people cities, um, yeah. but I've seen them change over the years. What I find interesting is that 
to in many places, and I, this is not true probably for the service industry, not if you, I don't know, create a new brand in the service industry, but for a lot of industries, a lot of places, I actually feel China is now, ironically, more common sense, more down to earth, um, more entrepreneurial than many places in the US, like the Bay Area um, public officials, is extremely hostile to technology. And so, was, you know, a lot of states, a lot of cities are extremely hostile and that's driven by their voters against technology and anything that has to do with entrepreneurship, um, which I find very surprising. Um, the, the way I grew up, and I think we, we have this, this the, the entrepreneurial mindset is still, it's very strong in Eastern Europe, you know, people who went through this experience, it's very strong now in China. So there's a lot of areas that, that came up where, if you would have asked me 10 years ago, I would have never predicted this. Yeah, I, I, well, I think now. Maybe I'm an idiot, have, right? You're the expert. Uh, well, no, I mean, I think it's hard for anybody to predict, right? I mean, I think it's fair to say, uh, you know, over the past, like since what, since 1990s to, to now, like it's near 30 years. 30 years China has lived like billions of people out of poverty, um, poverty and um, you know, has developed amazing uh, technology domestically and some kind of even going abroad. And you know, to the point that you talk about is the infrastructure piece, the high speed uh, railway, um, the speed of deployment is just frankly amazing. I mean, I read, I probably read the same article that you were reading this morning. Like the length of um, uh, of high speed railway uh, in China can make across the U.S. from East Coast to West Coast seven times. So that's kind of I wish we had that in the U.S. You know, wouldn't that be amazing? You know, if everybody don't have to drive everywhere and just take the high speed train. Um, and so that you can make business meetings more productive and faster, and you can see your family and relatives easier. Um, so that's a good thing. I, I wish you know in the U.S. you know we have that, and we can you know make those happen uh, a lot faster. Um, at the same time, you know I think um, it, it's if you ask me, like I I'm kind of uh, in the middle in a way. You know, I was born in China. I came to the U.S. Uh, you know for school and a later kind of immigrant. Uh, immigrated here uh, as a U.S. citizen. So um, I still have family in China. So in a way, I kind of see both sides' point of view. Um, and, and a lot of times uh, I can understand, you know, both sides' framework and, and the viewpoint of the world. Um, and unfortunately, you know, um, just like the cultural um, adjustment, right? When I first came to the U.S., the cultural adjustment, cultural shock that I first experienced. And I think uh, a lot of times when a media and the top level people talk about the other side, there is a cultural misunderstanding and there's cultural mis, uh, just miscommunication here and there. Um, I don't know, you know how that will be uh, solved, or, uh, if any way, but for the work that we do, uh, at least, you know, um, you know, I hope that we can foster more innovation and startup in both countries because more activity, more business activity is always a good thing uh, for both countries. And when you have that, you kind of advance the understanding, um, you know, one little step at a time. Um, and, you know, that's kind of the hope uh, and a little bit higher purpose uh, of what we do uh, in, in, in terms of what we, want to, uh, what we want to achieve. Yeah. I think the, the frustration on the U.S. side is something where you feel we, 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 we help China to, to, to create this economy. Well, you know, you, you can say this is all bullshit and China would have figured this out on their own. Who knows, maybe, yeah. But, but I think the hope in a lot of um, officials in the US, I don't think this is shared necessarily by the broader public, is that there was this hope, you know, once the economy gets going, China is gonna look, not just look like Taiwan, it's gonna be like Taiwan. And that was kind of the hope that people had. And that didn't really, um, work out so well um, and maybe that's very understandable um, and I think this is this is what, what on, a, on, a, on a broader basis um, really is now creating this uncertainty what what's going to happen if this goes on because uh, uh, China is, is probably more entrepreneurial as we just said and more business minded and once this keeps going um, and I, I don't think a catalyst that it will stop in the next five or ten years I think it will, will just um, keep growing at that rate and will obviously um, you played with their strength. 
people are getting uneasy what this means for the rest of the world. And I think the parallels people people draw is like Germany, which you know people had big hopes after the first um, World War in 1929, Weimar Republic, it all looked like fantastic. And then Ger Germany just used their advantage in, in science, their advantage in technology, and use it against the good of the world. And that happened um, very quickly, right? It happened in a, in a less than 10 year period from um, Germany was the model case for rebuilding Europe after this devastating First World War. And 10 years later, it was basically just eating up Europe in a, in a really nasty way. So I think it doesn't mean that the Chinese um, mainland will work out the same way. It might be completely different. I'm just saying, I feel this is the this is what's behind this 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 retracement of what what the America was hoping for China would be. And of course, they are their own country and they can make up their own mind. But I think this is the disappointment in people's eyes that I see. Okay, so so let's break that down a little bit. So I think um, the the first point about like. Uh, you know, I, I, I'm on a different page than uh, the U.S. kind of help China build uh, the economy where it is today. Um, I, I think that might be a little bit overstatement because there is a lot, still a lot of effort, like a lot of uh, things that need to be put in, you know, on China's side, either in terms of leadership, in terms of, uh, you know, entrepreneurs, uh, their work to get to where China is today. Um, but what is uh, fair is that the joint the U.S. Uh, agreement of having China join WTO and entering to the international market, that's a huge deal for China to play at a global scale and therefore global uh, grow the economy. Um, and at the same time, you know, it's not a one side trade, right? You know, a lot of the um, U.S. company do want to have a place where they can set up manufacturing uh, uh, environment uh, and taking advantage of lower cost labors. So it just capitalism at work. So, you know, putting the just, you know, kind of ideology, you know, on the side, what's happening, it's just free market, it's just capitalism at work. Uh, that's what happened over the past, you know, 10, 20 years. Um, now, the second thing um, about the, um, you know, the, 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 uh, the politics side, that part, um, I have different opinion. You know, I, I, I think um, democracy is definitely a good thing, um, but it's not the solution to all. Um, and I think when most people, you know, think about a fear of China, um, I think about it in the 90, 10, uh, 90 or 80, 20 rule, you know, to be generous. I think 80% of people kind of uh, are fearful because they don't know China. They have no knowledge, never been to China. And what they know about China, obviously, is through the media and through the movies, through um, the, the the past um, uh, things that they that, that they have heard about. Now, the twenty percent are um, are the ones you know being to China, maybe like yourself, um, and also scholars that kind of point out you know with these two countries uh, it's going to be the number one and number two in the global stage. You know what's going to happen? What's the dynamics going to be? Um, I, I, I have my own point of view, um, but at the same time, you know, I would just say uh, different country might have different uh, system in place, you know, for the reason, given the cultural and given the history, um, uh, uh, that's why it's that's why it's there, and that's why it might have worked for them uh, for a period of time. Whether China will turn something, you know, kind of look in history like Germany, uh, you know, after World War one, uh, become, you know, what happened with World War II. Um, based on what I know, uh, if you look at the history of China, um, it's not, it's not that, um, how do I say this? Um, it, it, it shared a different type of nature um, in terms of, uh, you know, aggression and, and, and expanding its uh, geo geographic map. And I think Ray Dalio, he kind of pointed out a little bit in his book. Um, and I think that's part, I'm not smart enough to articulate it, um, but, you know, this deeply rooted in how China sees the world. It's not in the way that, you know, China sees the world like we want to take over all the map, like all the territory in the world. Um, it's more 
rooted in a way that China want to have its place in the world that's being recognized and being respected, um, you know, by the countries. Uh, Yeah, I like I like I like Ray yeah. Dalio's book a lot, and I, I know we both agree on that. The one part I don't agree is is he's he's too much of China bull, and I think he's 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 drunk the Kool Aid a little much. Um, but I, I, I on the other hand, I fully agree with you too. Um, an autocratic government it doesn't have to be bad; it can be much better. And the the history of democracy and the way we see it as a one thing that solves it all, I think it's a lie. Um, it what what it does it. It long term reduces the risk, often at the um, at the cost of reducing progress, like we see in India. Right, India is way behind, um, and it can't make up their mind about anything. So, mm -hmm. it, uh, democracy, and it, you know, especially if you don't have institutions for long running democracy, I think it's it's kind of a uh, almost like a virtue signaling on the right many times. It's mm -hmm. you push out this value of democracy, but it's actually. It, If it doesn't have the institutions, if it doesn't have the borders, if it doesn't have the people who know about China, as you say, and not just from the movies, but actually know by understanding and talking to people, and like, that's a big part of what we want to do with this podcast. Mm -hmm. If if people don't have this this opportunity, they are not able to participate well in a democracy because they're basically sheep, right? They're they're not um, enlightened about what they're actually voting for. Even if you just vote for a person, in turn, this person might actually um, have an agenda on, on specific topics. So I think it's, yep. it's, that's that's very interesting. I think we agree on both sides. What I do feel, and that makes me a little crazy when I go to China, and I know this because I, I grew up in Germany with this, Germany has a huge superiority complex, and this is because they didn't have the role they wanted in life, and they lost two wars. I don't know what it is, but when you go to Germany and you talk to people, and they're honest, and you have a couple of drinks, they will all bring out the superiority complex, which is kind of ugly, if you ask me. And Germans are not the only ones. Japan has that. Uh, China has that. There's a bunch of countries who have it. Um, like India doesn't have it, for instance. It is, they, they have a superiority complex, but it's, say, on a scale from one to ten, they may be at a two. And Germany and China and Japan, they're closer to a ten in terms of superiority complex. And I felt, well, this is great. It, it kind of pushes you forward. It's often, mm. you know, the, the motivation of doing things better, being better at manufacturing, doing everything perfect, which drives the economy to an extent. I think it's a very dangerous two-edged sword, and I feel we have that mm. in China. Wait, so just so I understand, so when you say superiority complex, meaning that uh, you say uh, your experience in China is at 10, like fairly high, meaning they yes. feel pretty good. No, it's pretty well. It's good for the economy. I, I always feel because it kind of pushes you into this uh, this sphere where you feel like they say Germans they go um, mm -hmm. southern Europe or they go to Africa and they they, they, they they're in this arrogant worldview of the it needs to be like in Germany. Germany is the best country in the world. If the water doesn't run, this country. Sucks. Ah, I see. And Americans have that too, but it's more and you know they're more playful. They're more open to other ideas. They they behave like this, but they don't really mean it. In my point of view, they probably are the five in my scale. But I feel China and, and Japan, they're pretty high in there. And I always feel a good driver for economy, but really scary if the scale tips and for whatever reason this country is really pissed, because then they're going to be really pissed. I see. So I, I actually have a really different point of view. Uh, mm -hmm. I actually think the scale for China is fairly low. I mean, compared with Germany or compared with Japan. I think there is a deep-rooted insecurity um, in a lot of Chinese people, um, not just about like what well i mean mostly is about what happened in china's history over the past 200 years right china was like you know just fall behind invaded many times and uh, you know signed a lot of uh, you know unfair treaties uh based on uh, uh you know what we have learned so that part um i think china is still kind of in the recovery phase that um, that kind of seeded the insecurity uh, in the nation's psyche in a lot of ways. So that's for one. And and the second part is um, the just the, the, the pure pressure, the pure competition dynamic. Um, when you're living in a country that has what's, you know, 1.3 billion people, or so, I mean, just huge amount of um, competition that you have to, um, you have to go through at every step of your life, right? Either it's getting to Uh, a best college through Gaokao, the national uh, uh, college exam, where you have to compete with, not like in the U.S., but you have to compete with hundreds, thousands of other people to get to that one spot. 
um, it's, 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 it's just kind of embedded in you when you grow up in China. So I don't think, uh, I, I think most Chinese people, and you know, frankly, including myself, right, grow up in China, uh, we have this deep sense of insecurity. We don't feel like we are better than anybody, but we do feel like we have to, we have to work hard to get a place um, in this I agree world, with you, but right, I feel like survive. it's the, the, the mirror of, of, of the superiority complex is the insecurity. But yet they, they mm -hmm. both are the, the same thing of a different sides of one coin for me. But it's, How it's so? I think we need more time to dive into this. I feel this is really, it's complicated because it's very, it's very abstract. It's a big generalization, but I feel there's a lot behind it that drives um, people's everyday life and their attitudes that nobody really talks about. Mm. Yeah, I mean, we can talk more about it, like at the next call, you know, uh, some other time off time offline as well. But uh, I, I, like yeah. that. I like that idea. I yeah. have some quick questions prepared for you. Um, yeah. If you want um, to answer them, ideally, just with a sentence or two, that would be great. Okay, sounds um, good. What, what do you think is your most contrarian view that you hold? In terms of investing or? Sorry, can you say that again? In terms of investing or just... No, anything, anything. Um, anything that you can share on the podcast. Um, most contrarian. Um, oh, the main, I, I would start with investing then. You know, I think the activity, investment activity between U.S. and China right now are overlooked. Um, the act, business activity um, is not going away. So whoever can unlock that and can help entrepreneur to start journey in both countries, um, you know, will have a lot to gain. So that's one of our investment pieces. Okay. Mm -hmm. Going somewhere, we're going back to China a little bit, but what's, just for personal reasons, what's your favorite city in China? Shanghai. Okay. Can you tell us why in, in a short, short explanation? So Shanghai has uh, a lot of uh, activity in enterprise space, in the robotic space that we care about. Um, plus, for me personally, you know, it's strategically located between Beijing and Shenzhen. So when you fly uh, to both places, take meetings, it's only two or three hours away both ways. So uh, I like that a lot. Plus, you know, I mean, Shanghai is, has the best food, best view, and best everything. So it's definitely one of the my favorite places uh, to stay in China. If it can't be at one of the big cities, what would be at one of the smaller cities, like just, I don't know, less than 10 million people? Uh, Xiamen. Xiamen would be a great place to, to live. I don't know about to, uh, to work though, but Xiamen, you know, is an island city in the south part of China, right next to Taiwan. We're really, really relaxed, uh, a lot of seafood. Um, you know, I spent some time over there and I really uh, enjoy uh, uh, Xiamen quite a lot. Okay, like uh, going, going to a very different topic. Yeah. Records filed some um, prediction uh, 2038. Uh, do he event eventually it was revised from 2045 to 2038? I learned last week. Do you think the singularity is actually going to happen, or it's just um, someone you know drinking too much of a Kool Aid? Um, well, I mean, if if you put the time scale long enough, anything could happen, right? Um, but for the time points that you refer to, I, I kind of doubt it. Um, but, you know, separate topic, but I do think humans are going to Mars. So one day, hopefully in my lifetime and in your lifetime, that, you know, we'll be able to make the trip and really kind of have human species live outside of the Earth. And I do think that's kind of uh, in near term and that, that's achievable. Okay. Yeah. I always ask that um, to get a sense of where people stand, but uh, it's something I'm personally very interested in. Do you... I think we live in a simulation. What does your gut feeling say? And do you feel like if if not, will we start to simulate ourselves at some point? It's a good question. Uh, I don't think we're living in a simulation because um, it has a lot of characteristic that's similar to simulation. But uh, but I think we live in the real world. I mean, with a lot of things that has consequences. So um, so to that to that regard, uh, you know. I, you know, but the answer is no. Do you think we will simulate ourselves? Because this is a big topic about AI, right? If you 
can create something very close to AGI, like a little bit of consciousness maybe thrown in. You can kind of download that piece of, say, problem solving that you have in your brain, put it in an AI. It won't be a full human, but it will be part of like a, like a say, it's, it's your Chinese-speaking uh, personality uh, that you apply to uh, Chinese philosophy. And you can put this in a, in a, in a simulation and then run through a million different um, um, options out there and it will present you, but info, not just because it's, it's kind of a personalized AI. So you, you simulate solving this problem with the AI, but also your own brain, and then you just look at the results. You think we're gonna do this relatively quickly or that's too much science fiction? I, I think that's definitely something exciting. Um, I think it's achievable. Um, and um, um, I think probably like 10, 20 years, uh, probably that's the time scale, uh, time, time scale that we're looking at. Um, but one thing I would say though, um, like we probably not able to get the full autonomous AI um, uh, type of solution for a time being of 10, 20 years. It's always gonna be human in the loop um, to solve a problem. Either it's, you know, the, 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 scenario, the scenario that you described or for the um, enterprise company or that. Um, so anyway, would so that my, Would have been my next question. So one of the founders yeah. of GPT-3, um, he kind of uh, made that, wow. that argument that there's a good, opportunity, good chance um, and an opportunity that the uh, GPT-5, which is supposedly out in two years or less, um, is going to feel like AGI to pretty much everyone who tests it. Um, it beeps will, won't know how it thinks and will probably won't have a lot of feelings to share. But he felt like on a, on a purely Turing test and beyond level, we, we have, will have trouble to distinguish it from, from uh, an AGI. Do you think that's realistic or GPT-3 is just a bunch of statistics and it's never going to happen? I think that's realistic. Um, and I think for passing the Turing test, that's sufficient enough. Now, um, there is something kind of deeper about just on the philosophy. And things man-made is not going to be as 100% perfect as what happened in nature. Right, our consciousness and our brain are built by nature, and uh, there is this things about how complex our organism has to evolve to where we are now. Um, you know, I think humans, uh, either it's AI or anything that we have built, can um, can get to maybe eighty percent, ninety percent of the complexity, um, or in terms of beauty of design of the product. But I just think that last five to ten percent. You just never be able. To, we just never be able to fill the gap uh, against with what is being created in nature. Yeah, that's interesting. I feel there is so much to the human brain, but but, yeah. but it kind of feels to me that those are survival mechanisms, right? That we, we adopted them because they made us better at surviving and predicting the future. In turn, is better than surviving. So you're highly selected for the surviving, obviously. And I. I I feel a machine would be driven by the exact same um, survival mechanisms, right? So if we, we invented morality, we invented religion, and uh, we invented them because it made, a, made us better at surviving, I assume, because otherwise religion wouldn't be around anymore. People would have um, gotten rid of it a long time ago. When I feel AI will go through the same pressures, but just as a hyperspeed, right? It could happen in, say, 10 years, but we had to go through the last, last 10,000 years. And I feel AI will come up will come up with very similar conclusions than we have sooner or later. But it will be much faster at this. And there's obviously this big um, debate that once we have AI, we, you know, it will only look at us for a moment. But it will be ten minutes later. It's already um, way past human AI. Do you think that's what's going to happen, or no? This is going to take a long, long incremental path. Yeah, that's a good point, uh, and that, that is good, uh, good, uh, um, uh, good statement. Um, I don't know if we have built that environment yet. Meaning, uh, if you can create an artificial uh, environment or the eco so, sort of ecosystem per se, right, similar to nature, with the evolution, with the survival of the fitness, uh, then you kind of just let AI, that machine, kind of evolve by themselves, um, and then you can run that um, simulation and run that process. Um, just you know, for a long time or for a short amount of time and see what come out from the other end. Um, if that's the premise, then I think it's possible you can create uh, AI, either it's algorithm, um, you know, like GTP, uh, sorry, yeah, GTP3 or GTP5 that can 
um, get to as close to as human consciousness. Um, but my point, my my point of view previously is that I think in, in the reason I cannot explain, and it's just kind of like you know from the philosophy uh, that I subscribe to, there's always that one to two percent that you cannot get to uh, the complete uh, nature-made consciousness. Um, and then, you know, you can have conversation, you know, just like they, you know, you and me talking, right? Maybe one day I will be replaced by, by AI and which is should be sufficient enough to have this conversation. Um, but I think all that, your first meeting with the entrepreneurs will be run by AI. I promise you that in like five years from now. Yeah, I think that that, that, that job can be replaced and will be replaced. Um, and, uh, you know, for me, I'm looking forward to that for sure. Uh, although, you know, definitely <laughs> yeah. it will replace part of my job. Circling back to entrepreneurs, that's my last question. We touched on that earlier. But if you, if the insight that you have now, and uh, say you would, would not do venture capital anymore, you're too bored, if you would do a couple of startups now, what would be areas you would be looking into, but as specific as you can, as you can share them? Um, yeah, so, so this is a good question. So actually, uh, I might write a post uh, just in terms of uh, the startup that we request. Um, and we will kind of outline the concrete ideas that we'll be thinking about. So the, the way that I think about this is that, uh, again, to our earlier discussion, we invest in company from the point of view of partnership, just like co-founder. So except that we happen to write checks and we can't write multiple checks. So if I were to start a company today, uh, which is equivalent of way to saying, you know, which companies that I think are promising, I would like I would, I would like to be a co-founder uh, in. So again, so in terms of high-level verticals, um, in turn uh, like legal, uh, AI for legal compliance, and AI for healthcare, AI for manufacturing, and AI for like finance and fintech. And one of the idea I'm pretty excited about, I mean, just to give some concrete context around it. Um, so there was a lot of uh, human hours being uh, being spent in terms of legal document review and, um, and, and you know, filing forms and all of that. So that can be easily replaced by AI, but it cannot just be done by PhD in, uh, in computer science or statistics. It has to be paired with uh, somebody has domain expertise uh, in terms of what to build and how to solve it, uh, the problem. So I'm actually, we're actually looking at a few companies um, in the space uh, and if I were not doing investing, you know, I might find a co-founder um, that has that domain expertise and really build it out because it's a large enough industry, has billions of dollars spending, um, both from the uh, consumer consumer end, also the business end. Um, mm -hmm. But at the same time, uh, you don't have an automated solution, uh, and, you know, for it. Um, so, and also one more thing I'll add. On the scale of B2B and B2C, this is the case that I'm more excited about B2C side because a lot of consumers are not really well educated by what type of form to fill out um, in terms of the certain things that they want to do. They either hire a lawyer or they go to legal Zoom and figure it, figure it out themselves. But a lot of, um, oh, I forgot the exact number, but like if you think about like 40 to 50% of a lot of legal actions or legal uh, things that consumer, everyday people like us want to do, like fighting tickets, or you know, taking somebody to a small claim court, or you know, just kind of uh, avoid the spam call. All those things can be done in an automated way, um, and uh, the the market is huge. Um, so I think there is a lot of opportunity uh, in that area for sure. Yeah, that sounds like a great opportunity. It's uh, definitely something everyone wants to get rid of. Nobody wants to deal with forms and like small legal matters. Even and if, if yeah. AI can do this, it would be fantastic. Yeah. On that positive note, um, thanks for doing this, Jay. That was awesome. Thanks for talking to me about China. I know this is a sensitive topic. No, oh, it's fun. It's great uh, chatting with you. Thanks for your insight. Thanks a lot. Awesome. Talk to you soon. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.